So the second form of pre-made model is simply just the raw train model itself with no JavaScript class wrapped around it that typically hides the inner workings to make it easier to use for beginners. For this, you would need to write the code to send data into the model and then extract data from it yourself using tenses that you just learnt about. Now, individuals or researchers may share their raw models like this, which can be very useful for finding and using examples that may still be in development or use models that solve less common problems where an example may exist but might not have full documentation. So there are two types of models supported by TensorFlow.js. The first one is the layers model, which is easier to inspect and understand at runtime, but might run slower as they've not been optimized. This is because they keep their high level building blocks for ease of use and debugging, which can help when creating new models. The next graph models are highly optimized and often combine multiple operations into one batch for very fast execution but are not easy to understand as a human if you try to unwrap them. Now, the only difference between how you use them, however, is the function you call to load them. So just be aware that the two formats exist for now and you need to use the right function to load the model when you want to use each. Now, both model formats are stored in the same way, consisting of at least two model files. So let's break down the key concepts of a saved TensorFlow.js model. The first file is named model.json. It contains a bunch of metadata about the model type, its architecture, and configuration details. The second file is one or more binary files ending in the .bin extension. Typically, these will have the name shard x of n .bin. Now, these binary files contain all of the trained parameters that the model has learnt in order to perform a certain task. Now, as TensorFlow.js is designed to work in the browser, the original complete binary file is broken up into the sharded files of four megabytes in size or less. This sharding into smaller files allows the browser to download multiple chunks simultaneously to speed up the page load time. Now, all of these files are simply hosted on a web server or content delivery network of your choice when you need to use them. And it should also be noted that by default, all of these files will be assumed to be in the same directory. If you want to store the binary files in a different location for some reason, then you'll need to edit the model.json file to show where that is. Okay, so assuming you have the location of a model.json file hosted somewhere, how do you use TensorFlow.js to load it? Well, looking at the TensorFlow.js API that's available on js.tensorflow.org forward slash API forward slash latest, you can see a loading subsection that specifies functions you can call to load the graph and layers models respectively. Essentially, both of these functions simply take the model URL as a parameter, which is just the location of the model.json file that you just learned about. Let's try this out. Now, in order to try this for yourself, head back to the TensorFlow.js glitch page as you've seen before and find the TensorFlow-js-boilerplate example and remix this to make a new copy of this project that you'll use to load a custom model. For this example, the only file you need to edit is script.js. Everything you see coming up will be written in this file. Okay, so in order to load a model, you need a model to load. Thankfully, I've made a very simple model for you that I trained on some fictional data. This model tries to predict the price of a house given its size in square feet. So the input to the model is a single number representing the size of the house, and the output is another single number representing the price it thinks it will be. As this is just an example I made up, it actually has learned to just multiply the input by roughly 1000, as that's all I did with the fictitious training data. But it will serve as a simple model that you can use in this exercise. Now, I've made this model available at the link above that you can see on this slide, which you'll use in your code shortly. Now, before I can proceed, you need to know if you're about to load a graph model or a layers model. Ideally, the person who created the model would provide some example code on how to load the model, but for this exercise, let's pretend there's no documentation. In this case, all you need to do is visit the model.json link and view the content in your browser. Once the page loads, you'll see a response like the one you see here. At the very start, you can see the model format and in this example, you can clearly see this is using the layers model format. Okay, so now you can move on to write the code to actually load it. Okay, so here you can define the path of the model.json file you want to load as a constant, along with a variable to store the loaded model once it's ready. 
Next, you can create an asynchronous function called load model that will actually call the TensorFlow.js APIs. The first line calls await tf.loadLayers model and is passed the location of the model path value that you just defined above. As this takes time to load, this is an asynchronous call, so you must use the await keyword to wait for it to finish loading before continuing execution. Once it's loaded, however, it will be assigned to the model variable as you see here. Now, once the model has loaded, you can call the model.summary function to see details about the model that was just loaded. Finally, to actually execute the code in the function you just defined, you can call load model on the last line here to start execution of the code above. Now, if the model loaded without any errors, model.summary will have printed some useful information about the model to the console. For the example model that you just loaded, it will look something like this. Now you'll learn more about what some of these terms mean later in the course when you create models for yourself. However, there are some important things for you to note right now. First, as the model you just loaded was a layers model, the summary shows you the types of layers the model uses behind the scenes. As you learn what these layers are later in the course, this can help you understand other people's models and what they're doing. Next, it also provides details about the tensor shapes it will output from each layer. Take note of the last layer's output shape as this is the shape of a tensor that will be returned to you after running data through the model. You can also see the total parameters contained in the model, which gives you an idea of how many tensors the model uses internally itself. Diving a little deeper, here you can see that the input layer output shape is null one. The input layer is a special layer representing the inputs and does not contain any trainable parameters as you see on the right. Now, depending how the model was made, this may not always be present in the model.summary, in which case, check the documentation for details on the expected input layer shape if it's not shown. In this case, however, the number one in the output shape of the input layer shows that it expects a single number as an input. If this had been, say, the number two, then it would expect two numbers as input because the shape represents the length of each axis of a tensor. The null value on the left means a batch of any size can be passed as an input. And what does that mean exactly? Well, it's quite common in machine learning to perform many predictions in one go for efficiency, which is known as passing the inputs as a batch. If you've got seven input values that you want classified, instead of calling model.predict seven times, you can pass a batch of seven inputs at the same time, and they will be evaluated by the model concurrently whenever possible. Now, TensorFlow.js expects inputs in models to be batched, even if that batch contains just one input. After all, a batch of one is still a batch. And in order to do that, you need to store those values in a tensor whose rank is one level higher than the raw data itself, as you're essentially putting that data into an array containing those values. So data that could have been stored in a tensor 1D would need to be stored in a tensor 2D to be used as a batch. Therefore, this example model needs to be passed a tensor 2D object as two axes are specified as the input shape. The shape of a tensor that has seven examples to classify in this case as a batch would be 7-1, which is a valid shape input for this model as the null value indicates any number is allowed. If you had just one value, you could pass a tensor 2D object with the shape of 1-1 one, one, and that would also be valid. It should be noted, however, that if you try to pass a tensor with an incompatible shape like 1, 2, you'll see a shape error on the console like you see here. This is actually a very common error and is usually due to a misunderstanding of what the model needs as an input, so always check the model.summary if you're unsure. Okay, let's head back to the code to actually pass data into your model and predict an output, which is known as inference. Here, you'll expand your existing load model function as previously coded. The first line creates a batch of one and has a single input value. Here, you're passing the value 870 as an input, representing a house whose size is 870 square feet. To do this, you can call tf.tensor2d and pass it a 2D array containing a single element as shown. The next line of code is similar, but here it shows how you can pass three values at the same time as a batch, with many inputs to pass through the model simultaneously. Note that it also uses a tensor2d object, like you saw on the previous line, just with more example input data. 
Next, for each set of examples, you can call model.predict and pass the 2D tensor you wish to use as an input, which will then perform the inference. Remember, inference is the act of running the data through the model to get an output. So it's this line of code that actually uses the model. Now model.predict returns a tensor object from which you can then print the results that come back to the console using the print method on the tensor that's returned in each case. If you'd like to get the results in a form you can actually use in JavaScript instead of just logging to the console, you can use the array method instead that will return an array with the correct output shape, which you can then loop through just like any regular JavaScript array. Finally, don't forget to dispose of the tensors once you're finished using them. Here, you can call the dispose method on tensors you've created to clean up the memory they've used once you no longer need to access them as shown here. Now, it might be surprising, but you actually created six tensors when running the prior code. Two tensors were created when you loaded the model itself. And if you check the model.summary output, you'll see that the total parameters is two, indicating that two tensors were made internally. So the act of loading that model will cause it to create those tensors at runtime. Next, two tensors were created for your inputs. And finally, two tensors were created that were returned to you as outputs. Make sure you dispose of them all once you no longer need them. Otherwise, you might cause a memory leak in your application, which is where the memory usage grows to infinity and would eventually crash your computer if you kept calling this function. Okay, so if you run the code that you just added, you'll see the output tensors printed to the console as shown. You can see for your input of the single value of 870, it predicts a value of around 866,000, which as expected is roughly 1,000 times the size of the input, representing the house price it thinks is the answer. In a similar fashion, the second predict using a batch, you can see that you get a batch of results instead. This will be in the same order as the inputs presented, which you can then iterate through as needed. Great, so you can now successfully load a model from some URL and run it in the browser. One thing I'd like to point out is that it's really simple to save any model you load so it can even work offline using the web browser's local storage functionality. TensorFlow.js provides a convenient function that makes this super easy. Just call await model.save and pass to this save function the local storage address you'd like to use to retrieve it at some later point. Next time the page loads, instead of loading the model from a web server, you can just load the model from local storage instead, allowing you to use TensorFlow.js models in more advanced implementations like progressive web apps that can work offline. Now to check if a model is saved in local storage next time the page loads, instead of loading the model from a web server, you can check tf.io.listmodels as shown first. This will return a list of models that are currently stored locally that are usable. You can then load the model just like you did before, but pass it the local storage URL instead. Great, so you now know the essence of how to load and use any raw TensorFlow.js model out there. In the next section, you'll learn how to use model gardens like TF Hub, but have a whole selection of models all in one place for you to load and use, along with some more advanced tensor manipulation for dealing with models that may do more than just predict a single number as you saw in this example. I'll see you over there.